Welcome to the ACHA certification prep video series. My name is Tim Spence and I am joined by my colleagues Greg Moon and Craig Puchetti. We are going to take you through 10 additional example questions from the ACHA exam. These are super valuable, so you're going to want to listen up. You will also hear advice from a certificate named Chase Miller who recently passed the exam, so that will be helpful as well. Before we start, we do wanna go back and just review a couple tips for passing the exam. If you're like me, you haven't taken this exam in a while, so, or a, a, any exam in a while, so um, here's a couple tips that we would propose to you. First of all, read the questions carefully. Secondly, answer only what the question is asking. In other words, don't read into the question. Third, compare answers and determine the most probable. You are gonna get some questions where it, it looks like there's multiple right answers. You have to determine what is the most probable. Utilize all the time available to you and don't rely solely on your experience. In case you missed it, we have a whole series of uh, exam videos here. And uh, the one before this, we did look at 10 additional questions. So you wanna go back and listen to that. And then there's one that just talks solely about preparing for the exam, tries to demystify the examination a little bit. So with that, we're gonna jump into the 10 questions and I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Right. Hey, thanks, Tim. And uh, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us in this um, these sample exa uh, exam questions. I uh, just want to uh, kind of give you an idea that they're, they're broken down mainly into three major categories. Uh, it's under recall, application. It's basically recalling what you know as a professional, what you've been doing basically all your professional life and just remembering that, um, uh, but don't rely on that. As Tim said earlier uh, in another uh, recording, uh, you can't just rely totally uh, wholly on what you think you know. Um, a lot of times uh, there could be, um, you could be exposed to different types of conditions, different states have different regulations. And um, so uh, to apply what you know is very important, but to apply it, um, uh, as a as a healthcare designer is very very important, and also your analysis. You're going to be uh, asked to look at the information and uh, analyze it and make a determination from that. There'll be multiple choice questions that uh, will um, uh, expose you to that type of uh, uh, question. So, um, question number uh, eleven is: If a healthcare facility design contract includes the requirements for evidence-based design decisions to achieve the best possible outcomes, what is the architect expected to do? Um, we've got four items here. Um, uh, first is to, um, is to interview um, clinicians and staff during schematic design. Next is to replicate decisions of a similar high-performing healthcare facility. Uh, the next is to uh, conduct a post-occupancy evaluation of patient and staff satisfaction. And lastly, um, to base decisions on credible scientific healthcare uh, environmental research. So let's think, uh, think about the question and don't try to, again, uh, as Tim said, don't try to read too much into it um, uh, to understand um, evidence-based design you should not have to be interviewing clinicians and staff during schematic design. They're not gonna know all the uh, uh, important information that, de uh, that develops and uh, uh, has been developed over the years and the research to make this uh, an important uh, item, an important topic to their healthcare uh, facility. Uh, to replicate designs of similar high-performing healthcare facilities, uh, your facility probably has nothing, no uh, relationship to just about any other facility ever done. 
So to replicate design is just basically copying something that looks cool and it may not be the right solution. Uh, to conduct a post-occupancy evaluation of the patient and staff satisfaction, post-occupancy means the building's done. And usually a post-occupancy evaluation is months after the building is done. Way too late to be um, uh, including the requirements for evidence-based design at that time. The project's finished, you can't be expected to go back and redo. So the answer is D. D says to use credible scientific healthcare environment research. And there's a lot of it out there and um, you should be able to apply that um, to um, your design and be able to uh, uh, explain that well and clearly to the clinicians and staff. The sample exam question 12, this is also a new one. Um, and uh, you know, challenged a few of us um, when we when we actually saw it for the first time. So um, you'll have fun with this one. An architect is programming the relocation of a psychiatric suite, which includes two social spaces, to accommodate a total of uh, fifteen uh, adult patients. These social spaces include both active and quiet common areas. The program, the amount of space for the combined area should be approximately how large in net area. So this is a recall um, kind of in recognition and then an application really combo question. Um, when I read this, I knew what it was looking for. Um, I immediately grabbed FGI and flipped to the behavioral health section. And just to, I knew they were going to define a um, square footage Per, um, per patient, and I, I didn't actually know what that number of square feet um, were per patient. But um, so this would be one of those, if you didn't have um, you know, some of the details in FGI, you might be stumped. You could potentially deduce it um, by dividing all those numbers by like 15 patients to determine what seemed reasonable. But in this case, if you were to go to FGI, you'd see that um, it was 25 um, square feet per patient in the area that talks about behavior, uh, behavioral health and the a need for uh, active and um, uh, the active and quiet areas and the requirement. And so if you were to uh, divide that or multiply uh, 15 by 25, you actually end up with 375. So your answer rounded up is 400. So this is another tough question because it's one of those analysis questions. You have to understand a variety of concepts and kind of come bring them to bear. Sometimes when you see a question like this, question number 13, the, the initial response is like, I'm just overwhelmed by all the things that it's asking you. So let's work through this. A, a hospital seeks to maximize throughput of its four ambulatory surgery rooms. So you know, right off the bat, get some good information there. Four ambulatory surgery rooms. Operating room utilization time, including turnaround, is 105 minutes per case. Existing spaces and utilization time per patient are as follows. Three admit and dress cubicles, 25 minutes. Two surgery prep bays, 30 minutes. Six stage one recovery bay is 65 minutes. Eight post recovery chairs, 105 minutes. What additional space is required to optimize throughput? Is it A, surgery prep bays, B, admit and dress cubicles, C, stage one recovery bays, D, post recovery chairs? What do you think? If you look at, at this, you can start to say what of those different areas feels like a little bit of a, a throughput issue. And um, if you recall from your FGI studies, you'll, you'll notice that there's a ratio of one um, prep prep space per operating room that's required. So you have four 
surgery rooms, but you only have two surgery prep bays. So that's the answer, A, surgery prep bays. <clears throat> Question 14. <clears throat> an inpatient hospital is considering renovating an area to relocate an undersized department. The department manager has requested installation of a new laminar flow hood. This type of department is most likely, uh, is it most likely imaging or is it pharmacy, the cafeteria or endoscopy? Now this question is um, basically asking you to understand what is required in these spaces. Imaging would not require a laminar flow hood, um, nor would uh, endoscopy. Uh, the cafeteria is gonna have hoods, but they're for cooking. Laminar flow is gonna be needed for the pharmacy. So uh, pharmaceuticals can be prepared in a clean environment. So the answer is B, the pharmacy. So sample uh, exam question 15, um, when analyzing adjacencies of an emergency department with 80,000 anticipated annual visits, which of the following represents the most important relationship? Again, the most important relationship. And then when you're, you're talking about emergency department and you look at 80,000 anticipated annual visits. So if you just want to get a sense of, um, you know, how how big is this? What kind of, what's eighty thousand? And if you were to look at that, um, I, I did the math. That's um, what fifteen uh, about fifteen hundred um, per week, about two hundred and nineteen per day, and it, that comes down to about nine nine per hour visits. So you get a sense of what kind of emergency department we're dealing with in terms of size. So, um, so what's gonna be uh, in, a, in a facility of this type of size, what's gonna be the most important relationship? So um, A, observation rooms located near trauma rooms. B, trauma rooms located near the lab. C, trauma rooms adjacent to the decontamination room. And then D, direct access from ambulance unloading to trauma rooms. If you look at all those, you do kind of a, uh, your analysis, uh, kind of understanding the interconnectivity of variables there and the type of facilities you'll land at D, direct access from ambulance unloading to trauma rooms. All right, we have another adjacency question. Question 16, a common departmental adjacency relationship would be to locate a CDU, which is a clinical decision unit, adjacent to which of the following departments? A, surgery, B, medical records, C, emergency, D, nursing units. So this has you going back and understanding what a clinical decision unit does. A clinical decision unit is a unit where patients are placed when providers are deciding what to do with them, to keep them overnight or send them home, or they're waiting for a bed to open up. So since the emergency department is usually the front door to the hospital, in many cases, um, that is the one that is most likely to be adjacent to uh, the answer is C, emergency. Question number 17, we still have an emergency department. The emergency department staff have stated that they don't have the sufficient space as evidenced by patients and equipment located in the corridor. The architect should first. Now this is, um, uh, this is, I guess I would call this an application because you're gonna be trying to determine what is the most important thing? How you should attack this problem as your as a planner, as a healthcare designer? Uh, are you going to review the volume and capacity data? <clears throat> are you going to study expansion options, or maybe propose a fast track care unit, or assess clinical decision unit length of stay? 
um, uh, answers um, items B and C in my mind are going to immediately um, uh, bring up the uh, option of needing to expand the building. You're gonna be adding money to this uh, 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 project, uh, causing uh, the, the hospital, the facility to have to uh, spend more money, which you know, uh, uh, money is a tight thing. It's gotta be very important, every dollar counts. So they've stated they don't have sufficient space but is an expansion option, um, is that um, uh, the option uh, to assess, assess uh, the clinical decisions unit length of stay? This is an emergency department. You usually want to get those people out of there. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, there'll be a, a time when there is an overload. There'll be a time when there, there is a bottleneck. But to review the volume and capacity data, I answer number A should be what you approach first, because a lot of times your the staff, the hospital staff is not actually using their space efficiently. And uh, you can review their volume, review their capacity, and maybe come up with a solution on how to move patients through the department faster. And maybe they even spills out further into past the department, emergency department to imaging and lab. So it's one of those things that you just need to understand that you can analyze first where you think you're going with your problem and then uh, uh, attack the problem from there. Great. Sample question 18, which is, which is one of the most dynamic components for staffing of a 125 bed suburban community hospital due to cyclical demand? So, um, you know, rereading this question, um, you know, most dynamic, so um, dynamic always being in constant change, 125 beds, suburban, community hospital, cyclical demand, things are changing all the time, cycling. Um, what, what, what does that sound like? I think we've been on a roll with, uh, with this department. So, um, so uh, does it sound like an intensive care uh, department? Does it sound like emergency? Ambulatory surgery or imaging. In this case, it's going to be the emergency uh, in terms of just being dynamic and um, having to basically uh, respond. Uh, the staffing uh, can vary considerably based on um, the uh, cycle of patients um, and the influx and sometimes surgery. Because your question was about a suburban hospital. This question, question 19, is about a critical access hospital. When designing a rural critical access hospital, which of the following is the most important aspect of a plan? There's that word most again. A, efficient use of professional staff. B, lower maintenance cost. C, outpatient access. C, helipad location on site. You look at a lot of these, they, they all look pretty good, right? Good answers. And if you haven't had the chance to work in a critical access hospital, um, it makes the question even a little bit more difficult. But one of the things that uh, rural critical access hospitals struggle with the most is getting A, the efficient use of professional staff because staffing is just a huge issue Recruiting staff out to that location is a huge issue. So the answer is A. Okay, question number 20 <clears throat> is another question about the critical access hospitals. And this is gonna be a question that um, uh, you need to understand um, different uh, um, regulations and um, understand what the definition of a critical access hospital is. And it's in, this, uh, in these four points. Which of the following kinds of patient beds are allowed in a critical access hospital? So you, you should know that there are certain beds that you can have. There's a certain number of beds that you can have in a critical access hospital. So the four items that we are looking at 
that we'll make a determination from are 10 rehab beds, 12 psychiatric beds, 25 inpatient beds, and number four is swing bed skill nursing, skill nursing beds. So we have four options here. So again, when you look at something like this, uh, I like to uh, explain that when you see a, a question that has multiple choice, pull out the one that's wrong. And that's the one uh, that'll help you determine whether it's A, B, C, or D. Um, if you look at <clears throat> which of the following kinds of beds are allowed in a critical access hospital, you'll, uh, you'll know that first of all, critical access hospital has to have 20, uh, can't have more than 25 beds. So that's uh, anything with a number three in it is gonna be a good answer. Then it's just understanding what beds don't go in a critical access hospital or don't count because you can have up to an additional 10 beds. Uh, is it 10 rehab beds? Is it 12 psych beds? Uh, or is it swing beds for uh, a sniff unit or skilled nursing? Well, um, <clears throat> the answer is going to be that you can have rehabilitation beds and you can have the swing beds. Uh, 12 psychiatric beds take you over the, the count. And also in a critical access hospital environment, um, uh, as in Tim's, uh, in the previous question, you might have trouble getting the right staff to staff a psychiatric facility. And generally those require special treatment, but that, that uh, 12 psych beds puts you over the number. So your answer is going to be C, uh, re 10 rehab beds, the 25 inpatient beds, and the, um, uh, the, the, the swing beds, uh, skilled nursing beds. Great. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Tim. Um, we've uh, reached the end of this uh, great series. Um, hopefully, everyone has found this very informative. I encourage everyone to go back, um, look at them again. If they uh, have some additional questions, certainly uh, going through the questions and seeing kind of the recommended approach is always helpful. Um, you can see the resources there on the left-hand corner, um, phone numbers, a website, LinkedIn, and the Health, uh, health Architects. Healtharchitects.org. Of course, the handbook is going to be very, uh, very valuable for giving you detailed information on everything um, that needs to be known for every step from application portfolio through exam. So be sure to spend some time um, researching that and reading through it. Um, with that, uh, this uh, concludes our series. Um, and uh, we're going to close out hearing from a recent uh, certificate, uh, Chase Miller, who's going to give you some advice uh, about the uh, exam taking. Thank you and have a good one. Hi, my name is Chase Miller, and I'm a senior architect with BSA Life Structures. I've been an ACHA certificate for one year, and I'm involved with the COC Committee, um, Communication and Outreach, uh, essentially working with the team to uh, broaden the name of the ACHA within the industry, get out there in front of current certificates and new certificates uh, and those that are considering it. Um, letting them know what's going on within the ACHA and what's uh, what current events are. In my opinion, the best thing about being part of ACHA would be the relationships that we're able to build with other colleagues and peers across the industry uh, within different regions um, all over the country and, and uh, internationally. Uh, getting to see what those individuals are doing within their projects, best practices, things that are working and not working, and just having that collaboration uh, when we come across each other uh, through webinars, through conferences, and things like that, just building that up and being able to have the opportunity to get to know some really great people and see some really great work that's being done across um, the country just to advance the industry. What advice would you give someone preparing for the exam, and how did you prepare? Uh, I prepared by going back to many resources that um, I had come across throughout my career. Uh, I also went back through several previous projects that I had, had the opportunity to work on from a variety of areas and, and uh, uh, departments, types of projects, and just refreshed myself on why we did certain things within those projects, understood you know, different nuances within the types of projects, inpatient, outpatient, 
um, a variety of departments, uh, support services, things like that. Just understanding how the whole hospital comes together uh, in, in an acute environment. Uh, and then also looking into some ambulatory projects and, and better understanding um, the way that, that healthcare um, is delivered in that setting as well. Uh, some of the top resources that I utilized uh, as I was preparing for the exam included uh, SpaceMed. Uh, that was one of my favorites. It gives a very broad and very um, comprehensive uh, description of all aspects of healthcare design. I also obviously utilized the FGI, um, the guidelines, uh, which really added a depth of um, technical expertise and, and detail to what I was studying in space med. And then lastly, I would say um, uh, the code, code books, uh, NFPA 101, um, and, and just being familiar with life safety code and, and everything that comes with that uh, and how that's integrated into a, a project. I would say the exam is probably more intimidating than it actually is. Uh, the exam was not as bad uh, when I actually took it. Uh, the, there were some questions that were kind of all over the place that I wasn't expecting, but there were also questions that were very straightforward and, um, you know, things that we've done throughout our careers and it's just right there top of mind that we recall doing. Uh, so it's it's a lot less intimidating ever having taken it than it was before taking it. So I would just encourage you to uh, bite the bullet, register, sign up, and go ahead and take it because it uh, is not nearly as scary as you might think, and it is totally worth it.